certificates that we were working on that's actually the one that didn't make it on the curanderismo and in, in introduction and I wanted to clarify that mistake it, that one if when I sat back and thought about it that's the one that when it went to the to the faculty senate all the scientists lined up on curanderismo right making it seem like this was non-scientific that it was anecdotal etc etc and so they all lined up in chemistry and biology and would support it. And so I finally got up and gave them a 10 minute presentation on curanderismo and people that supported it clapped, but it didn't pass. The point is, is we learned something about that, that how strong science is and so forth, but other ones did pass. And I wanted that recorded so that if somebody sees that, they'll say, well, I'd like to maybe research that one. So that was my error. But I'm gonna start over again and so I'll probably duplicate some of the information. Buenos dias, my name is Ramon del Castillo. It is with great honor and humility that I do this presentation with esteemed scholars, educators, y la comunidad at CSU Pueblo. Let me begin by introducing myself with the relevant experience that brings me here today. I was born in Newton, Kansas, and yes, there are Chicanos living there. My grandparents came into the United States of America in the early part of the 19th century during the Mexican Revolution that took place from 1910. 
However, scholars disagree on an endpoint, as a uh, convention may use the year 1920, but some ended with the 1917 Constitution or events in the 1920s, and still others argue that the revolution slowly unraveled until 1940. Nonetheless, it did end. And uh, on my father's side, Grandpa Rosalio Lopez del Castillo was from La Ciudad de Mexico, and on my mother's side, Grandpa Antonio Macias was from La Piedad, Michoacan. They worked at the Santa Fe Railroad and the Cutting Hay Packing Company, respectively, for several decades. I attended a Catholic elementary school, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, in Wichita, followed by attending a Jesuit high school, Chaplain Capon Memorial High School, where I worked weekends and summers at the school to pay tuition, which was augmented with my mother's hard work in the packing house before she died at the young age of 49. I have been in Colorado since 1972. I received a bachelor's degree from the University of Northern Colorado in 1976 with a double major in sociology and Mexican-American studies. And I earned two master's degrees, one in social science in 1983 and an MPA or a master's in public administration from the University of Colorado at Denver and a doctorate in public administration from the same university in 1999. All of my graduate research has been in areas related to Chicanos and Chicanas in American society. Some of the research and published work include Chicanos in post-traumatic stress disorder during the Vietnam War. That was my master's thesis. Effective management strategies when incorporating curanderismo into a mainstream mental health system. That was my doctoral dissertation. I worked with the curandera and will make some comments about that. In some of my uh, in, in some of my postgraduate work um, and publications include I walk indigenous ways of knowing in counseling theory research and practice. Here, it just, it's been on since about 2020. I had the privilege of working with Native Americans and some Latinas, two Latinas to help me uh, augment and enhance my literature review. That's currently being sold, I think, in uh, one of the, uh, the, big, the big bookstores, but that just came out. And then I, I did an, uh, an article that's gonna be a chapter in a book that's being written by an African American uh, out, of the, out of the University of Iowa. It's called po Population Growth, Activism, Social Movements, Coalitions in the Future of African Americans and Latinos and Latinas in Denver and beyond. And that, that's coming out in the next five or six months. And I did some work with an attorney. Uh, there was a, a young man in my class and he followed me out. He said, can I speak to you for a minute? I said, sure. And I said, what's happening? He said, I work for a nonprofit organization with young kids, and what we do is we try to lessen the time that they're going to do in prison. And the story was that this young kid had already gotten 25 years with no chance for probation, for parole. He had been involved in, 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 in a, a pretty, a pretty heavy thing. And what had happened is the judge said to the attorneys, "What happened to this kid?" He, has a, he was in high school, he was playing football, he was wrestling, and all of a sudden, in a matter of two years, he's looking at 25 years, and he said, I'll look at anything. I'll look at anything that will help me understand what might have happened to this kid. You know, again, as I mentioned, my background was in community mental health. The name of the, uh, the piece is Culturally Competent Assessments with Immigrants, Mexicans, and Mexican-Americans Transforming Misperception into Culturally Relevant Perspectives, and it's published in the High Plains Anthropology Journal. And, and what happened is, I talked to the social worker, he tells me, I'm just gonna be real honest, I know nothing about the culture, and that's why we were trying to find somebody. So I sat down and wrote this 35-page paper looking at the literature, my experience, and I gave it to them, and uh, what had happened is, they asked me if I would be willing to visit with him in the county jail. And I said, absolutely, I will. And they gave me the psychological evaluation done by the psychologist. They had him with some really hard diagnostics, really, really terrible 
I mean, they, they'll follow him forever. I mean, it was really sad. And so they gave me two videotapes of the mother being interviewed and of the, the prisoner being interviewed. And then I sat down and I wrote, I wrote and I made commentary on the psychological evaluation in this paper. And he ended up getting uh, 11 years that he had to do with maybe five years in, uh, afterwards for a post possible parole. So the point being that we got involved with some attorneys and gave them cultural information that they knew nothing about, ostensibly, and helped this young man not end up spending 25 years of his life in prison. I would have loved to have met with him. I met with a psychologist who actually was published in why they should not send 17-year-old kids to prison for life. And he gave me some insight, and this guy is really culturally competent, and uh, he's married to a curadera. So uh, that's part of what, what I've done. The six poetry books uh, that are published for the most part tell poetic stories about nuestra gente, and I share this because my vision was always to teach Chicana and Chicano studies at UNC when I walked in the classroom that I mentioned in 1972. However, even 50 years later, there are very few universities that offer advanced degrees in this wonderful field of inquiry. I think there's three PhD programs, one's in borderland studies, I think one's somewhere in California and Texas, and then I know that New Mexico University has a PhD in, in Chicano studies. I think that's awesome. That's how much the field has advanced and it even needs to go further. My approach this morning, excuse me, afternoon, is to include information and stories that support the uniqueness of this field, its interdisciplinary philosophy, and how the theory of praxis works, that is, theory and practice, wherein I will draw upon my own experience, having been affiliated with Chicana and Chicano studies for about 50 years, 35 of those years at institutions of higher learning. I will also mention my experience uh, in how I get papers mixed up. <laughs> Give me a second here. In the professional fields that I have had the honor of working, including higher education, mental health, and community and economic development. So again, as I had mentioned, I'm interdisciplinary, and wherein I draw from my education in the field of Chicano studies. And what I did do with the questions that, that sister, the sister gave me to look at, I sat down and wrote this paper based on that. And that's why I was kind of hesitant about saying too much, because then I wouldn't have anything to talk about. I'm a pretty quiet guy, right? <laughs> I also borrowed some, some demographic information from Brother George here, George Otterby, and we now know that the U.S. Hispanic population by the year 2060 is going to be 119 million. In 19, 2010, it was 50.7 million. We've over doubled that, and we're going to continue to grow. A lot of it's going to depend on the, on the policies that they do related to DACA and immigration. That's going to help tell the story. But people are not going to stop coming into this country. The Mexican-American, the Mexicano uh, migrant worker is abused. They are, they are fungible commodities that come in and out of this country at the whims of the policymakers as they shape policy to keep cheap labor in this country. That's a fact. Even when you look at Black Lives Matter, what was the issue? It was about money. And they, keep them as, they kept them as slaves because they needed money. So different with the Mexican of the, the immigrants and from other countries now that come into this country. So that we have data to support that. When the economy is bad, they, the, the immigrants become the scapegoats. They, they change policies, they kick them out. Then they let them back in when they go to war. down, three to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to make some comments about, about Southwestern studies. As described in the website at Colorado College, 
Southwestern Studies examines, quote, examines the region of the greater Southwest through a variety of lenses, encouraging students to see the complexity that diverse peoples have created in specific places. This blend of peoples and histories living in a distinctive landscape provides a model for study applicable to any region. Using the tools of traditional disciplines in inf and in combination with interdisciplinary perspectives, students will learn to observe and analyze places, peoples, and policies, and to use these skills to solve real problems, unquote. Got that from Southwest Studies Colorado College. Wonderful statement. The Southwest, and if our mom county seems to be the major emphasis, but that includes the states that were annexed into the United States of America, although we know now that Mexicanos live all over the country. I got a call one time from uh, Athens. I thought it was Athens, Georgia. And they called me, says, uh, you're, are you Ramon Del Castillo? I said, I am. So well, we've been looking for you. We want to know if you'll come to Athens and do some training with our city council. And I said, I would love to go to Athens, Greece. And she says, oh, no, no, Athens, Georgia. I said, oh, well, what's going on? Well, African-Americans and immigrants were fighting, but they were working in the chicken industry, and there was, there was just a lot of conflict going in. So I went in and did a two-day training with the Board of Education, the superintendent, and the city council in Athens, Athens, Georgia. I keep wanting to say Greece, because I guess I might want to go there one of these days. So one of the main differences, in my opinion, between Southwestern and Chicana and Chicano studies is that Southwestern studies ostensibly examines diverse peoples. And based on the local, regional, and national demographics, one of those groups would be the Chicana and Chicano population, which incidentally is again predicted to grow in numbers with the continued challenges of immigration and naturalization, DACA, and the other policy issues that can have negative effects on this population. It appears that Southwestern studies has a broader emphasis regarding human populations. Therefore, and I could be way off target, one has to ask if they have the capacity without Chicana and Chicano studies to investigate or examine historical, social, psychological, and cultural issues in depth. Cultural issues being the key word. Would Southwestern studies offer the in-depth analysis that a Chicana and Chicano studies would offer phenomena regarding indigenous civilizations and tribes that lived in and around Mesoamerica for thousands of years. There's a branch of Chicana and Chicano studies referred to as Mesoamericanism that examines cultural, historical, and low social Mesoamerica and all of its complexities prior to the arrival of the Spaniards and the subsequent deculturalization processes that occurred following the Spanish conquest. In essence, it lays the cultural foundations of the modern day Chicana and Chicano. In order to comprehend the philosophy of Chicano and Chicano studies, one must travel back to 1969 during a tumultuous time in history when social movements were prevalent. Keep in mind that Chicana and Chicano studies was absent in higher education for a very long time. While other academic disciplines constructed knowledge Chicana and Chicano studies was unknown. It was a time when subordination, oppression, structural racism, and economic inequality were normalized for Chicanos and Chicanas. The Chicano studies, studies discipline, uh, discipline's genesis is built on struggle and social change. The goal, the, the goal of Chicano studies as written in the plan of Santa Barbara developed on February 17, 1969 by Fernando Negocia, a UCSB academic advisor who was only one of a handful of Chicano administrators who played a pivotal role in the development of the plan was liberation. Liberation, emancipation. We're talking about people wanting to govern themselves. It is a 155 page document written by the Chicano Coordinating Council of Higher Education, drafted at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and described as, quote, a quest for cultural expression and freedom, unquote. At the time, it was perceived to be a radical pro proposal that combined education, research, and political consciousness 
with the objective to empower and break open a pathway towards higher education for generations of Chicanos and Chicanas to come in. Its intention was to provide a coherent and socially relevant education, humanistic and pragmatic, which would prepare Chicanos for service to the Chicano community and enrich the total society. The point being, like the Native American brother mentioned, that it's for everybody. Because there's this, this stereotype that only Chicanos should take it. Well, we should take it, especially since we've been robbed of our history, but other groups also need it so that we can develop some understanding of each other. When placed in the context of higher education curricula, students will be prepared to work and live for the purpose of realizing political, social, and economic change. As you might imagine, the hundreds of Chicana and Chicano Studies departments with majors and minors, the, the Chicano and Chicano Studies programs and classes throughout the country have shaped their respective visions and missions for their own, their own universities. Self-determination was another of its, another of the Chicana and Chicano Studies goal. That is an ability to create one's own destiny or a community's destiny of cultural pride and dignity. Those things that were mentioned in the dialogue earlier that were lost in space and time throughout history during, during the, the conquest. Uh, epistemological validity for Chicanos and Chicanas entails self-knowledge, community knowledge, and knowledge whose outcome was social change. One of its principal tenets is that Chicana and Chicano studies departments and programs would develop and sustain a healthy working relationship to local Chicana and Chicano communities. This is probably one of the issues that places Chicana and Chicano studies apart from other university departments. And I'll give some examples. Interaction with local communities served the purpose of creating healthy relationships, offering classes and consultation, creating collaboration, and recruiting students while working towards that concept of social change. So what is knowledge? How do you know when you have it? And by the way, what do you do with it? Knowledge that is not put to practice, no, no vale, has no value if it doesn't make the change that we need. It makes you look important and feel important, but if it doesn't make the change you want, then you gotta get, go back to the table and see if the theory that you develop is working or not. So within its 60 year here history, the, the discipline has constructed knowledge with special emphasis regarding the Chicana experience, Chicano, Chicana experience, including very distinct epochs. The first one is Mesoamerican history and culture and the many contributions made by our Chicana and Chicano relatives, more specifically our indigenous ancestors, but also included our native tribes on this side of the border, as well as descendants from the Southern tribes of Mexico. We are the same people. For example, my wife is part Apache, and she also says she's a Manita from, from New Mexico. I'm a descendant of Michoacan, Mexico, the Tarascan civilization, the Purepecha tribe. However, we are both Chicanos and Chicanas. Her family is part and parcel of the Tecolote land grant in Bernal, New Mexico. Again, I'm from Kansas. The point is, is that in addition, other Mesoamerican indigenous tribes existed in Mesoamerica that included the Zapotec, the Mayan, the Chichimeca, the Mixteca, the Azteca, which were the same in other distinct tribes that will be examined for those, those interested in understanding the relationships between West American history and the Southwest. One of the most prominent people is Dr. David, David Carrasco. He's an anthropologist, he's at Harvard right now. And I had, we brought him into Denver when he found La Mapa de Coaptin Chan. And he did a two day presentation for us. He's a Mesoamericanist. He knows Mesoamerican history. Why? Because if we're ever going to recover from historical and intergenerational trauma, we have to go back. Because if you're a Jungian psychologist and you believe in the collective conscience, then you know you have to go back and figure out what caused this pain that we've been carrying all of these generations and generation after generation in addition to the new 
traumas that children have now, including the pandemic and including, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, racism, institutionalized racism. These are all things that kids bring in the classroom. Don't think that they don't. You know that. When you have problems, you don't leave them at home and go to work. They fester inside of your soul. Imagine centuries of that kind of oppression. And that's the research that we're looking at now is intergenerational trauma, and that's what this book is about. I was the past chair of the master's program at Regis University. I took students to Guatemala to participate, learn, study, and to co-create curricula in the civil society sector. The civil society sector is analogous to the nonprofit sector here. And we were trying to develop master's level curricula, right? So we met with several cities. We kind of landed in, in uh, Guadalajara, but also went to, to uh, uh, Guatemala. In Guadalajara, it's interesting. I took the, the MBA, the chair, the dean of the MBA, the business department with me. I asked him to go with me. And in a matter of 15, maybe an hour and 15 minutes, they had already started talking about developing bi bi-level curriculum between business and uh, the civil and business in Mexico, fast. But when we got to talking about the nonprofits, it was a different thing because in American society, nonprofits are really considered that they're not supposed to make money. I mean, that's, that's not true. They can make money, but they have to pump the money back into the services. They cannot give it to the dividend holders. And they came to me and said, Sabes que Ramon, it's going to be difficult to pass this because whether our people have master's degrees or not, we're not going to be able to pay more money and they're going to work just as hard when they get the master's, whether they got it or not. That's really, really good, good nonprofit work. So I spent time trying to develop the curriculum, but it didn't, it didn't transpire. I happened to be in Mexico City in 2006 when a man by the name of, it would have been Bush, signed the, the bill to, board, to build the border wall. We got there that night, we went from Mexico City, where we met at the University of Mexico. We went to Guadalajara. Oh, I mean, went, yeah, went to Guadalajara. I got to my, my room, and there was a light blinking. I had a message, and I thought, well, who knows me here? And I picked it up, and it was some professors I had met from Mexico. And I called them, and they said, call them, Dominos, it's muy importante. It was late, I called them, and they said, Ramon, I'm glad you called. And I said, they said, we have a problem. I said, what is it? I said, your president just signed a bill to build a wall. Y nosotros, la gente aquí quiere saber por qué queremos trabajar con estos. Why would you go work with these people? Their president just signed the bill, and they're threatening not to come to the conference. They had a thousand people that had signed up. I said, what do you need from us? Well, for starters, we need somebody to talk at the beginning of the conference. So I had the dean with me. So we said, we'll call you back, and we talked, and he said, you're gonna have to do it. And I said, yeah, and he says, Ramon, don't, don't get too radical. And I said, have you ever talked to the professors? They were me reading Marx when I was in diapers. I said, they are well equipped theoretically. They've been Paulo Fred and Marx, Gramsci. There, there's nothing I'm gonna say that's going to do anything. But I stood up all night, did my spiritual work, trying to think, what message do I want to leave these people, my brothers and sisters on this side of the border? And it finally came to me. And I opened up my speech by saying, we came to build bridges, not walls. And they stood up and they clapped. So we were able to make, make an impact of some sort. Thank you. Yeah. So, the, the university we worked with was uh, in Guadalajara, Iteso. So now, what I decided to do was rather than talk about it, I'm going to read a couple of poems. And this has to do with the name of this place, the, the Aslan. And it has to do with the philosophy and the history of Aslan. But I went to, on top of Teotihuacan in Mexico City, and I went on top of to the top and I wrote poetry after I caught my breath. I wrote poetry and this two poems came out on top of that. My imagination and my spirit and so forth. One is called Take Me Back to Aslan. Take me back to Aslan, close to the borders of Tenochtitlan, 
where I can rekindle the burning desire of a fire refusing to die. Take me back to Waslan for a sojourn so I can visit the spiritual ancestors roaming the countryside in search of a thermos bottle full of justice, knowing that a cup full of anecdotes mixed with bulke is all that is left. On top of Teotihuacan, my spirit stood watching soldiers wearing ancient football helmets, riding horses, mythical creatures whose horns were lost during Armageddon, in quest of a substance that never turns old, called gold, with its magical powers that transforms men into weary beasts, ready to devour big feasts. On top of Teotihuacan, my spirit watched ancient basketball games, Tlachli, played by Aztec nobility who took their children up the sacred mountain while those trabajadores played flutes, singing tunes in an ancient language, Nahuatl, later mixed with another idiom, Castilian Spanish. The two languages danced around the sun, paying homage to El Sol, creating a new parlance. Never once did our ancestors shout, Nahuatl only. On top of Teotihuacan, my spirit smelled chile, crushed in molcajetes, blended with an effervescent odor of a historical morning during La Noche Triste when an impostor resembling, resembling Quetzalcoatl raped La Virgen Tonantzin, cutting the umbilical cord to my Tarrascan ancestry, creating a bronze race called Mestizo. On top of Teotihuacan, my spirit touched the souls of Las Mujeres draped in purple garments, sold as esclavas, boring beautiful brown children, now illiterate in two languages, both clinging on to a past, an intercourse of two idioms respectfully called Spanish. What happens to a portilla left out in the sun? Does it turn back into masa and then run? Or does it become brittle and crack, broken into a million pieces placed in the sack, ready for the marketplace and a fast sale, paid for by food stamps that come in the mail. What happens to salsa left out in the rain? Does it become diluted, causing us internal pain? Or does it become more picoso, mixed with foreign substances, making it mas hermoso? What happens to maíz growing in the sea? Does it grow tall, becoming strong like it's supposed to be? Or does it drown like a fish taken from its natural habitat to become a dinner dish. What happens to a beautiful jardin filled with flores de todos colores when it is not watered? Do the waters wilt and bend in with the silt? Or do they crumble into fine dust, feeding the earth that must become the human spirit again? What happens to a mestizo left without a culture? Does he become a victim for a monstrous imperial vulture? Or does he learn how to seek out his soul, no longer a victim of an outdated role? Take me back to Aslan. Let the soft brown earth cover my body, bringing my body into communion with my culture, and let my spirit glide into a cielo so that I can finish my termination rituals and find my weary soul. Take me back to Aslan. Take me back to Aslan. You give me not a beer, but a water. George, we're going to bring me a beer. Uh, <laughs> the second epoch is the Spanish colonial experience with 300 years of colonization and the effects that colonization has had on the Chicano and Chicano populations. And I'll make other comments later on, on colonization. I presented at the International Literature Conference in Spain in 2007, and it was beautiful to take Chicano poetry to Spain and have all the poets criticize the Spaniards, give them regañadas, and then to have a dialogue and talk about that. It, I, it was really healing when I left Spain. The fourth epoch is the Mexican-American War, 1846 and 1840 to 1848, with its antecedents culminating in the loss of the land to the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, and the Chicanos in the, United, in the United States, including the long-term effects of historical and international racial trauma, which include, I'll get that in a second. 
the effects, the loss of what colonization causes, the loss of culture, the loss of identity. We talked about that earlier, didn't we? The loss of land, the loss of indigenous languages, the superimposition of a foreign way of life, labor exploitation through the encomienda, the repartimiento, dead peonage in the hacienda labor systems. We became quasi-slaves. We might not have gone through shadow slavery and necessarily were owned, but we were slaves. Don't forget that. And, 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 and also the destruction of the social fabric of society, the negative impacts of racism, prejudice, and discrimination, internalized racism, and the oppressor-oppressed dichotomy. And let me make a comment when we were talking about the name, the identity. Dubois, the, the African-American writer, talks about the double consciousness. We have the Negro and the white man inside of their consciousness. Paulo Freire talks about the oppressor-oppressed dichotomy, but Paulo Freire is a Marxist. He's a Catholic, but he's a Marxist. It's sort of a contradiction. But when you read his stuff all about him, he's a Marxist. He called the oppressor-oppressed dichotomy. He was talking about class. He was telling us, inside of all of us, the master narrative has gotten hold of you. You believe in the master's way of doing things, and you feel guilty when you don't. That's how you've been socialized. That's the oppressor, and the oppressed is you. So the double consciousness, I got that thinking, and I thought, what if I put the issue of mestizo, the Spaniard and indigenous, although there were other amalgamations that took place. You had the Spaniard and the indigenous inside of you. That's the double consciousness. And that's why we go through what we go to. We've been taught that we have to be white, because white is the master. And that's why we don't why we want to be Spaniards. It's a racial issue. It's embedded in the structure of American society that white people have advantage and privilege. And when, when we get to talking about Black Lives Matter, I'll make the point. Think about that. That we, we, we want to deny who we are because if we say we're Indian or Nindio or indigenous, they were not liked. They were at the bottom of the totem pole of this caste system that Wilkerson writes about. They were at the bottom. So what do you do as a, psychologically? You deny it. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not, I'm not no Indian. Have you ever seen them? Look at me. I'm not an Indian. I tied my hair, man. I'm all cool now. We do it to ourselves. That is the manifestation of the long-term oppression that we've been carrying. That's internalized racism, and that's internalized trauma and intergenerational trauma. Think about that. Corky told us that in his speeches way back. Think about that, wanting to be like the master because we emulate the master. We want to be just like them. And what we have to do is dismantle the master narrative. That's what Black Lives Matter is really about. Let's tear it apart and include and become more inclusive like we're doing here. The fifth is the, the Chicano movement. And I'm not going to, unless I have to, at the tail end, if I have time, make comments about that. But as I mentioned, we were an invisible group in the Western Hemisphere. Some Chicano anthropologists tell us 30,000 years ago. During the, the Chicana and Chicano movement, we moved into visibility. And the poem that I'm going to read here, it used to be in Pachuco, but since I've learned feminism and become a feminist, it's now La Pachucana. Ah. So, can you get that one? <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Right there. If you notice, I don't know if the Pachuco, you know, it was characterized in Zoot, the Zoot Suit Riots. My dad's brother, my uncle Raul, was a Pachuco. And he had that, and I don't know if I get this on his hand, he had that. That's a cross. That was the insignia. Well, what did they call the Pachucos? Son puros pandeas, they're all gangs. They were not. The men and women in La Pachucada were heroes and heroines. Why? Because they wanted to keep their identity. Whether it was whatever they were dressed at that time with the, with the flamboyancy didn't matter. When Octavio Paz went to Mexico, I mean, went to, I came to the United States and wrote his piece in The Labyrinth of Solitude, he got called to the carpet and said, you were there for two weeks and now you're trying to tell us who we are? They were claiming their identity. So here it goes. I am 
your other you. You are my other me. Tu eres mi otro yo en la que es. I am hiding inside your soul, the one who paid an outrageous toll, whose signature was left out of the historical scroll, transforming to the master's narrative, a truth serum we are told, clouding your mind, leaving you out in the cold. I am the fine-tuned sculpture, hidden in shadows of obscurity, carrying linguistic phonetics, making me el vato firme, la vata firme, el vato suave, la vata suave. El vato pago, el vato resguacha, resguache, rescuing me from complete acculturation and fanatic symbolic annihilation. I am in your dreams and fantasies and vito terror, taking you to never, never land. I taught you how to shake hands with class that is como un vato loco. I visit you in your dreams in the collective unconscious where you are drowning. I helped you realize your true self. I am the ghost who haunts you. I am a hidden hero, a hidden heroine, an existential force refusing to digest self-hatred cannibalized by the forces of homogenization. I am the resistor, the protagonist of a play called life. I stood in my stuff to show you that I would not disappear into a maze of solitude and loneliness. I was the one holding you up when you flinched, wondering if you were gonna survive. I force you to stand up against the daunting pressures with colossal heroism and shout, Viva la raza! I am your other you. Tu eres mi otro yo. You are my other me in Lak Esh. So, in, in, uh, in, in poetic terms, I had written a poem, the, the cousin to, to the pelado and the pachuco is el vato loco, and then we got the cholo. All right, these are all terms we use. So I wrote a poem called Vato Loco with the B, did my research and called not vato, but vato loco, and with my, my mentor with Lalo. And one day Lalo called me, he says, hey brother, I found your signature poem. And I said, well, diga me, what's a signature poem? He goes, this is the poem that defines you. I said, oh, I go, well, what? He goes, I was in San Diego, and somebody in Cool Salsa, where this poem is published, read your poetry. So from now on, that's your signature poem, the Vato Loco. Vato Loco, con su cabeza llena de mota, not in the past, start with fear. Can you hear as you sit idly in the classroom where the silence of indoctrination suddenly grabs you and makes the believer of false notions of inferiority and then passes judgment about your ancestors' feathers. Orale, Pato loco. Your path, they tell you, is predetermined that it is filled with solemn images where you stand behind bars while your intestines filled with crack. Either way, your conscience laying bare in the front streets that's whose propios barrios filled with homeboys and Pop-Tarts and nightmares and gruesome realities caused by the ingestion of filthy needles shot into arms full of tattoos. Orale, vato loco. Take off that handkerchief, ese. Take off that handkerchief from around your head and wipe away la sangre, the blood of a thousand years of miseria cuando sus carnales estaban cantando sweet, sweet melodies into the ears of the beautiful rucas about dreams that have never come true. Orale, vato loco, escape from the fires of an infierno that fry you like a crispy critter so that you can become the avena for the breakfast of the champions of society who eventually take everything that you are worth and treat it for sale as a commodity in the carbon market. Orale, vato loco, wake up, anachronism, that is not your dessert. Pan dulce y chocolate. Doesn't that sound better? Wake up, Bato Loco. Wake up. So let's talk about the importance, the question that was asked earlier that I kind of said I would come back to. The discipline of Chicana. Chicano studies is important to teach because 
in its uniqueness, it tells the story from a Chicano and a Chicana perspective. In this case, the history, culture, languages, etc., of Pueblo, Colorado would be included. And that story includes the Pueblo mural. You can see it better like that mural. That includes the mural. That's part of the history. And if you dissect it, there's images and iconography and all kinds of things about all of the epochs that we've been talking about. And let me make some comments on that. The story of the Pueblo mural shared by Charlene Garcia Sims tells the story. After being hired half time as a Hispanic resources librarian and the other half as a genealogy and special collections librarian in 2008, she envisioned the need for a mural that depicted the Hispanic history of Pueblo. She was astute enough to engage with scholars in this endeavor in order to protect research. Uh, and there were grants that were being offered and a lot of applications were coming in. Ms. Sims wrote a grant for a scholar to write this history. Dr. David Sandoval was a chosen scholar and he wrote a wonderful manuscript. Charlene raised the funds for the mural and it in, in, entailed, think about what this says, cooperation, collaboration from administration, finance, public relations, facilities, special collections, etc., with the library. That's what needs to happen at this university. It's no different. It's a different institution. And I recollect being asked as a scholar to read the manuscript and listen to Dr. David present his manuscript to a committee at the Pueblo Library and provide feedback. He was masterful in his presentation. There was nothing I could offer. To me, that was an honor. She also raised additional funds and a request was put out for a bid for a successful artist to do the mural. Charlene wanted the mural to follow the book with historical characters and timeline. She assisted David in designing the mural into three visible, three movable parts. The first panel to the left was about the past to include the indigenous history. And rather than get up I'll, in this mural, look up there. Uh, the third panel to the right was about the present 20th century and the middle panel was about different people and significant symbolism. The first and third panels are balanced. For example, the first panel shows that things were built with wood as eight, num eight number 18 shows a tree. The third panel shows how we moved to still panel 43 or number 43. David took such an interest in the story, we covered as much as we could and made sure pe many people in the book were in the mural such as Fred Valles who led the United Mexican American Steelworkers of Pueblo in, who was successful in winning a case against the CFNI. That mural is beautiful. That's part of your history. Don't do like what they did at Our Lady Guadalupe in Denver to, to Sister Carlota Espinosa's mural. They put a wall up in front of, front of it. And I, I, write for the Rock, I was writing for a, a seminario then. I used to write for the Rocky Mountain News. And uh, I, wrote, I wrote a piece called 11th Commandment, Thou Shalt Not Build Walls. And the priest called me. The city, their, their government structure called me, so we'd like to meet with you. And so we met with them, a couple of us, and they wouldn't budge. They had all kinds of rationalizations. And now that mural, even though it's historical, there's a wall in front of it. And it's really a contradiction when you think about the, the issue that immigration and undocumented workers are fighting for. So. We need to call out those institutions, uh, irrespective of who they are. When we need to, as those, those of us as activists know that. And we do it with respect and intellect, with hope we come in with a, 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 a good outcome. But Chicano Studies views that the knowledge that has been constructed in the last 60 years, while in the academy, as a strength, and continues to draw explicitly on the lived experience of students of color by including methods such as storytelling, family history, biographies, scenarios, parables, cuentos, chronicles, narratives, and testimonials. This has been the basis for creating the epistemological foundation for the discipline. They're always fighting that we know what epistemology, the, the root causes, the, the foundations of knowledge. What is knowledge? We have knowledge. We have knowledge that came in from the community. We have knowledge of people in this institution and don't ever forget that. Give people the respect when they come into your meetings that they have knowledge and something to offer. 
They may not know these big old words, but when I used to work with immigrants, anytime I used a big word, if I couldn't define it, I had to pay a nickel. So I had to study the dictionary for a long time. And then I learned, break it down in taxi cab driver terms. Because they, they like as Paulo Freire said, they know, they know that, they have knowledge, they just didn't have the language. And he thought they didn't have knowledge. They taught him how to work with the earth. They knew the knowledge of the earth, but they didn't have the words. So we can't say that they didn't have knowledge. Do they need more? Yeah, we all do, right? As I mentioned, I had wanted to include relevant experience in this presentation. I've shown the murals, the one from Pueblo. Let me share a few more paintings of scholars and beginners who have emanated out of grassroots communities in Denver and other parts of Colorado. The discipline has gone over the last 60 years, adding knowledge regarding major contributions to many areas of inquiry. The discipline has created major publication outlets, and you saw that with the sisters' presentation. And uh, many education outlets, enormous libraries that are filled with books, journals, dissertations, magazines, and newspapers. It has constructed authentic, methodologically sound research that has found and maintained a place in the academy. Think about that. Method, methodology, methodologically sound research. We know research. How do we know it? We went to America's universities for the most part. We learned the tools. But the problem is you can't create liberation with the master's tools. You have to create your own. And that's what this epistemology is going to do for us. It's going to give us our place in where we belong. And that's what all of us are doing here when we, can, can, when we start to create and construct knowledge. So I'm going to show you a couple of paintings. Uh, you said I could get up. Get this up. Would you kind of start at the beginning? I don't even know if I can see it from here. Well, you know what? I can see it from here. And I didn't show my slides, though, because the slides are what I've been reading. So would you go to the pictures, the paintings? Okay, right here. Well, we, then we saw this one, La Pachucada, the next one. This is, was, this is done at History Colorado. And uh, it, it, was, it was a tribute to La Chicana in the movement. Because let me tell you what happened in history of Colorado. The women came in and said, where are we at in the movement? Right now, there's a big movement, Chicana, Chicana studies, to create feminist thought and feminist practice. So there's women from all over. Deborah's in there. Deborah's right there. It's hard to see from that far, but Deborah's you know, sister Deborah's right there. And it's, there's another whole picture like that. That was done by uh, Lucero, Arlette Lucero. And the next one, she also did that piece in honor of El Movimiento. She's a fantastic artist. I bought her, I got the picture from there. Yo soy Chicano, tengo color. And it, it places the woman in the perspective of history. So they, they have double, a double consciousness being, being omitted in the general population then as women, as the double whammy, the, the, the double forms of oppression, the intersection part comes to, comes to life there with women and being, part, being brown women and other kinds of classifications as, as we talk about intersectionality. Go ahead. This here was done by her husband, her significant other, her husband, Stephen Lucero, who's a Mesoamerican artist. And he, his, work is, his work has already been being cataloged at the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian Institute. So think of, he's been, I think, painting for probably 40 years. I've known him since I've been, since 1970, since 1980, and he was doing it way before then. And I buy, I mean, he sells it reasonably. I bought that from him, uh, but I think that's Quetzalcoatl. Either that or it's a curandero, one of the two. I, got, I may have gotten mixed up. Next one, please. I saw this, and I'm a, re I'm a re recovering Catholic. Uh, I was raised, went to Catholic school, went to a Catholic high school, but I took issue with the church and a lot of its policies. And for me, I have, I have uh, three other brothers. Uh, one is uh, older than me, and two are younger than me. And uh, that, that painting, 
it was kind of, I bought that, I saw that, but I couldn't afford it. So I went to a step and I said, you know, hey, bro, man, I just got in town here and I've been here too long. I said, but I like to buy that. He goes, I'll, ma I'll make you another size, you know, with the cost. So I bought that to remind me of part of who I am and how we grew up with the Catholic beginning. My brothers had left the church and they said to me, they said, yeah, I told them, I said, I wish mom was here. Because we were having a, a brotherly discussion and they said, what do you mean? I said, why'd you guys leave the Catholic church? And they said, well, why do you hang on to it? I said, because I've been studying liberation theology and I have a string I hold on to. Because I love liberation theology. I think it's really a good philosophy. And then you guys, I said, if mom was here, man, she'd be giving you a regañada. ¿Por qué se salieron de la iglesia? Why did you leave the church? Because our family was married to the church, the Macias woman, women. And you're gonna find that. Respect that. For whatever you believe. No different than what we talked about, what the brother talked about. Respect people who they are and where they're at. And you're gonna get a lot of mileage. And eventually, they'll come to their own consciousness if it changes. If it doesn't, that's okay too. But continue to do the work. Next one. That's a piece of steel work done by uh, the sculpture. Uh, oh gosh, I had the names written down and I didn't bring them. Uh, it'll come to me. But that's Katrina Katrin and Katrina. When you walk in my living room, you see that. People go, oh, what's that? It's a, it's a good conversational piece, but I saw that and I wanted to buy one. The skeleton, Katrina and Katrina. Next. Oh, that's moi. But I, the only reason I brought that one is because Sister Carlota Espinosa, when I retired, showed up with the painting. Huh? She, in there. she came up and she presented it to me in front of the community. And I said, why do I deserve this from such a great artist like yourself? And she goes, because you've done a lot of work. You've done, I've heard you, heard you read poetry for I don't know how many years, and I just want to give it to you. I said, oh, bye. She goes, this isn't a regalo, it's a gift. But I, I, just, I, I enjoy looking at that one. And then, not looking at it, but having it. That, Leo Tanguma, if you ever go to the International Airport in Denver, Leo Tanguma is a good friend of mine. I sat on the committee after they had made the decisions for his, his artwork, but I went to see him because he's not doing well. He's not doing well at all. That's the kind of work that he does. That one, the next one, please. That's a piece also, I think part of that comes from, if you look at the, uh, the piece that's at the airport, what it is is, extinction. He called me one night and he goes, do you think you can get the committee together? And I go, what's going on? And he said, you know, I got a tiger up there. I got all things that are becoming extinct, but I forgot one thing. I said, what did you forget? And he says, I forgot the human being. He goes, and I want to paint it. And I have a feeling it's going to cause some problems. So get the committee together. So we all got together and we, we called the people that had paid for it and we talked to them and they, they were fine with it. But if you go to the airport, you'll see an African laying in a coffin with a shroud over his top. Leo was the first person I saw do a mestizo with African and either Indian or Mexicano. He had the African look and, and he brought to the consciousness that that issue of what we need to talk about the African influence in Mexico. There are books written about that. Oaxaca, if you ever been to Oaxaca, there's uh, uh, black Mexicans that speak Spanish. They're, you know, it, they're, it, they're all over, they've been in Mexico for quite a long time. That's part of our heritage. And that's, that's the Moorish side of myself that was given to me by uh, Jerry Rael after for the Cesar Chavez work we did for 20 years. But you can see the influence of the Moors and it, I thought it was fascinating that he did that. And when we did, we did our DNA, we do have the bloodlines that go back to Africa, the Moors and the Berbers, 5%. We did our DNA. So do it. Next. Ah, I did this one. My, my beautiful, one of my granddaughters. She was an all-state runner cross, cross country at, at, a, at a white school. Uh, I won't mention it. And uh, she's also an artist, and she had some tough times uh, when she was at school. When she was six, she came home. 
I was sitting in the living room and she went into the kitchen and Dorothy was there and she said, Grandma, am I too brown? And so I got up and I went in the kitchen and, and my Dorothy said, See, I know what's going on. What do you mean, are you too brown? She goes, well, the kids at school, they want to know when that tan's going to go away. Mm. And she's, she's Navajo, half Navajo. Oh, she's a quarter. Her, her grandfather's Navajo, and her mother's half Navajo. You talk about being jived. She can't get money, because they applied that, that statistic, like you said, the quantum, to her. They did to her mom. Her mom has her papers, right? So uh, I sat down and wrote her a poem. She was in pain and she didn't know why. Why, what's this happen, what's happening to me? And then she went, when Trump got elected, uh, the, uh, not, not, none of the runners, the other her teammates, uh, some guy came up to her and wanted to know when she was going to go back to Mexico. And she turned around and says, you know what? I've been here longer than you, I'm Native American. Maybe you're the one who needs to leave. And, but she was torn apart. She went home from school and cried. And so we got involved again. And so, right now she's a junior studying economics and finance, 4.0 average, but she's also an artist. And I said, I need a quetzal. My, my wife asked her, so she drew this. Grandma, am I too brown? A little Navajo Chicanita asked, sporting a contorted smile, her beautiful brown oval eyes squinting in confusion. Her face grimacing, lost in a delusion. Grandma, my schoolmates wonder when my tan will go away. Will it, or is it here to stay? Grandma, should I hide behind a cloud, or wear a white shroud when the sun comes out? Grandma, am I too brown? No, my child, you can never be too brown. You are God's beautiful creation. You are a bronze sculpture, a radiant flower, growing in un jardín de la raza cósmica. Sus raíces are tied to la tierra de su madre. Mija, color brown is part of an arco iris, closer to hermano sol. You are the fall, calling snow to come down and visit. You are as beautiful as the brown leaves falling from trees as summer ends. You are dusk, giving permission for the sun to go to sleep watching raindrops and tears fall silently. During times of darkness, grief and intolerance brought about by ignorance, you will never be too brown. You are part of a grand cosmology, a picture of innocence, now tainted with perjuicio. No, mi hija, you can never be too brown. healing work that I've been doing using Mesoamerican philosophy, I've learned that as a man it's okay to cry, that it's, it's human and it's natural. So what you saw was, it's about a human as, as, a, as a man can be, that share tears because of pain, that still teased me on. We talked about the interdisciplinary nature. Equally, I did talk about it. We've mentioned a lot of that. I want to mention two things real quick. Due to the uh, interdisciplinary nature of Chicana and Chicano studies, professors can teach their own discipline, filtering multidisciplinary information through the theoretical lenses of Chicana and Chicano studies, thus adding value to students' learning. With respect to historical contributions, for example, before the pivotal ruling in Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, in which the Supreme Court declared state laws establishing separate public schools for black and brown, black and white students to be unconstitutional, there was Mendes versus Westminster. In this 1947 case, Sylvia Mendes filed a lawsuit after being after being turned away from a whites only public school in California, the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional to segregate students of Mexican heritage 
in, or, in, in order to into inferior schools, laying the foundation for the groundbreaking ruling in Brown. There were also other legal cases, three major ones, and there's also one in Colorado, Colorado dating back to the early part of the 19th century in Mestas versus Southern Colorado School District. It history includes this. Townspeople had gained U.S. citizenship through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo at the end of the Mexican-American War. In 1912, a new school district superintendent in Southern Colorado, quote, forced all Mexican-American children to attend the Mexican school at a time when Colorado's constitution banned discrimination on the basis of race. In 1913, a railroad foreman in Alamosa, Colorado, tried to enroll his 11-year-old son in the school closest to the family school, to the family home. The student, Miguel Maestas, Maestas was denied entrance and forced to walk to another school seven blocks away. Maestas and other families sued the school district. Administrators argued that Latinos, Hispanics, were white and that children were segregated due to language differences and were getting specialized instruction. Ironically, many of the students spoke English. The final decision did not set precedent because it was a local court case. It didn't kind of the hierarchy of legal cases. Uh, and it finally recognized historically that Latinos advocated for the integration of public schools and improving outcomes for all students in Colorado. It demonstrated that Latinos were breaking new ground in school desegregation prior to Brown versus the Board of Education. How many people knew that? Good, thank you. Good. People don't. Not, not the, I just learned about the Mestas case about a year ago. Think about that. So what is it, what is, how does it translate to somebody? Well, they haven't done anything. Why should they be written about? Why, they, why should they be in history? They have no contributions. So that the law that just passed, that I was involved in, in HB 191192, and this is what I think Chicano Studies professors do that may set them apart is we get involved in public policy issues. We met with the state legislature. We helped shape the bill. It finally passed in 2019, and I read it earlier, so I won't read it again. But what that's going to do, it's going to open the doors. Why? Not a lot of teachers in public schools know about African American, Asian American, Asian, uh, Latinos, and Native American histories and cultures. So what does that mean? That means that you're gonna to have to become innovative here because that's a law and we teach teachers. You may not be a teaching institution, but a lot of people go become teachers. So there's there's a legal responsibility that we have to follow. And so we went, we started and I met with the board and they hired us as a couple of consultants. That's critical. Get a copy of that bill and read it and, and, and begin to tear it apart and ask the question, what role does the university and Aslan Center and other, other departments have? Because you're gonna be teaching all kinds of children. And I think that's breaking the ice. I think that's innovation at its best. Now we have to put the practice to it. Le falta la practica right now. And that's what we're working on. So what can you do? A lot of stuff was already mentioned. And I, let me say two things. Sister, you did a brilliant presentation. I would love to take a class from you. It was brilliant. You are a scholar. And two, we had dialogue going on in here. It was authentic dialogue. I thought that was amazing. That's what his dialogue consists of, listening, hearing, asking tough, tough questions, and then going through the feedback and then asking the question, what do we need to do now? We understand each other. What can we do together to cross these disciplines and departments and so forth? Two, uh, support initiatives and policy issues that are at the state legislator, at the state legislative offices right now. Uh, look at the policies within the institution that govern diversity and push to include more diversity. And I'll say that Metro, I told, I told my team that, I told the, the chairs that. You have, a, you have 120, hour, 120 hours to graduate 117 hours of white studies, and you give us three hours of a diversity to make people culturally competent. You can't do it. It ain't gonna work. It, that is not gonna work. I've been studying diversity for 40 years, and I still have a lot to learn. It's a lifelong process. 
we have a responsibility, and I think you should start increasing the number to at least six and maybe even nine. And as you might imagine, everybody protects their turf, and we had this awesome debate and dialogue. But you're going to have to have those conversations because they, you're going to ruffle the feathers of, of certain people in certain departments, visit public sector organizations and get involved, uh, look at the question of critical race theory. That was how I was going to close. I wrote an article for the seminario, but I won't read it. But understand what critical race theory is because if America's true to what it said it was going to do, that there's been systemic racism, meaning it's, it's embedded into the structure of society, then the only way that you're going to become, you're going to get rid of it is by dismantling that structure, which means dismantling the policies that govern the structure. That's really what critical race theory is. Even in law, they argue that even law was racist. It supported a lot of racism that happened when, when what was it, separate but equal? That they could have separate facilities as long as they had equal, equal times for whites and for browns? That's racism. But the Supreme Court, in its infinite wisdom, passed it for how long did, was it law until it was overturned by Brown versus the Board of Education. So law, Richard Delgado in his book said, law is it's not, it's not uh, immune from the vagaries of racism. They're also a very racist institution, and that raised the feathers of everybody. And they finally realized it is true. We need to change the laws. So in every, every place where we go, it's so, so consistent when you read you mentioned the word caste. Read Wilkerson's book. She argues that we're not a class system, we're a caste system. And some of what the brother was talking about is caste mentality. That you stay in one place and you stay there forever because that's your lot in life. And she compares it to class. Well, I would take her on on that one. I think it's an excellent book. But I'm more of a quasi-Marxist and I think Marx offers a lot for analytical tools. So. We're going to try to have a debate, or probably a debate, uh, and a dialogue on this with some folks that I run with because we're both, we're, we've read the book and now we're saying, let's, let's tear into it now. Get those kinds of learning circles together in your own group. And let me challenge you to something that's tough in all the work that I do. Put together a healing circle. For those times when things aren't going well, something's affected the institution, your community, and get your people together and keep healthy. That's all a healing circle is. And keep it a healing circle. Not, not a political circle or an activist circle, a healing circle. That's what we, I, I, I'm no longer uh, the group disbanded because some of the people left town, but we had a men's healing circle that we did. That's the kind of work that's happening. Uh, it had been mentioned, invite the, what Gramps, he called the organic intellectuals, the audio cats that you talked about. Who mentioned audio scholars? Body. You, that's right. Well, the, Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci would call them organic intellectuals. You got them all over town. And they are smart, brilliant people with good minds. And they can sit there and have a decent conversation with you anytime you want. And give them that respect when they come in. Treat them like equals because they have something to offer. And I think those are just some of the principles. And uh, keep working at building the department in Chicano studies with the spillover effect onto Southwestern studies. So I know I, I knew if I started reading poetry it would have the time to be gone, but that's it for as far as what I'm, I'm gonna offer this afternoon. I wanna thank you for being here. So I think we're gonna open it up for some questions. Don't make them too hard though. tell you where I got it. Somebody turned it in as an article to a seminario and, and the owner called me, Chris, and uh, we discussed it. And so I wrote the article based on the research that he had done. I, I didn't look it up. I didn't have the time, but he had enough data there to really lay out a good, a good, a good perspective. Yeah. Can you get the, the please, I, I can't hear. We had Ron Nestas make a presentation wow. on on the case in 2019, and some. Do you know what happened then? Did, did they approve it? 
they have My to understanding is that what happens even when you look at Westminster versus Mendez, Del Lado and Del Rio, uh, this back as 1930, there's four major cases that I looked at. And what happened is they would go to this to the, you know, it's a hierarchy of law, the Supreme Court all the way down. And at the state level, in many cases, they found common ground to to resolve the issue. In some cases, they went to the next level and it was ruled over and therefore it became a dead issue. Once it's ruled over by a lower court, that's it. So that's what happened to, to, West, to Westminster. But it laid the foundation because Thurgood Marshall actually wrote an amicus brief for Brown versus the Board of Education. And what I read, he went and studied Del Rio and Westminster versus Mendes. So it depends at what level it happens. And that's why it, they eventually, it turned out well for them, but it did resolve the problem until 54. And even after 54, they continue to segregate. In fact, they're segregating children now because of language. Look at the Harvard, I mean, the Stanford study that I, I looked at, they're segregating children right now because they speak a different language. When my wife taught bilingual ed, they had a lot of the kids in the hallways, not in the classroom, in the hallways, teaching them Spanish. And she filed a complaint, got in trouble, but they, they resolved the issue, said you cannot do that. When I was, when I worked for DPS, I worked with administrators and principals. There was a community that wanted to get rid of bilingual education because they had went from a, a centralized management governance structure to decentralization. And I was doing training on governance for the decentralized schools and smaller schools. And there was a school that told me, we're gonna get rid of our, our, our CDM decided to get rid of bilingual ed. I said, I don't think you can do that. I said, who are you? I said, you're right. I, I don't have the authority to make the decision, but I am going to see the, the uh, superintendent and I'll, I'll come back. So I called her, we met, and she said, what's going on? And she said, oh my goodness, Ramon, call a meeting down there. So we went down there, she said, that's, that's, that's consent decree, that's a legal issue, you cannot touch that. But people were willing to do that. There are sometimes bad blood between people of color communities, and it's being propagated and instigated by the media. Bad media that 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 really mis distorts what what happens. So that's why I wrote that article on working with African American communities, because you saw a lot of people come together during Black Lives Matter, and I like to see that momentum keep keep going because uh, you, they're already afraid of us anyway because we're growing in numbers. Imagine the kind of fear that would be developed if we were to coalesce with other people of color just to do good public policy work or activist work, how would they perceive it? And that, that's been the problem. I went to a board meeting and uh, we were fighting some tough issues, fighting political aid, et cetera, et cetera. And three groups spoke before we did. They were all white groups. And after they finished, they stood up. <laughs> and when we finished, they didn't even clap, but in the, the morning, the newspaper says, activists invade Denver Public School board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and the superintendent called me and said, we, did the, we, we talked as loud as they did. We were, we were intellectual, we were articulate, we did our homework. This group did nothing wrong. The media painted them as being activists, like that was bad, and that they invaded the school board. And that's what happens. It's so different than they criminalize the kids that, that chew gum. You know, and those are things that, that this, this, what do you call it, uh, systemic racism has to address. Those policies that affect us today. We, we're, I work with a policy group now, and the, the Latino Education Coalition. I've had the privilege of coming here and working with some folks here and, and really trying to, to make some change. So in the final analysis, that's what uh, critical race theory does. It wants to dismantle those racist policies and create more inclusive, humane policies uh, that include, that cover the issues the way they should be covered. So, yes. You, uh, um, I asked you which community it was because I've worked in Arkansas Valley and San Luis Valley, but I would have imagined that your answer would be La Junta. Oh. I just read a, a, a doctoral dissertation by Elizabeth Erdogan Blanton, and she's from Arkansas Valley, and she talks about the the basements being the classroom for the Mexican American students. So there is so much more than oh, sure. my assistant. And I don't, 
I don't know how you feel about this, but I don't think we'll be able to change anything until that type of uh, information, truth, is out there. And therefore, we need books like what you did, like Mr. Ottoby did, what you did here. We'll publish our own books. If, they're, if we can't get them, we do it. That's the whole point of why we do that. You write and you write and you write and you do write on because we have to document our own history because many times they be documented but not from our perspective. And so that's why you keep doing this kind of work until we get to that pinnacle of equality that, where we don't have to worry about all the, the, the processes of getting published. And oh my goodness, it's like, it's really, really hard process at university levels. So I, I read the book. They sent it to me. They wanted and they asked if we would use it in Chicano studies. I don't know if anybody picked it because about that time is when I left, but I left it there for some readings that I left the, the other professors there to, to, to look at it, maybe include. I was teaching a class in social justice and activism in the Chicano community. Another strategy, take your students out of this beautiful place that can be sterile. Take them out into nonprofits, take them into the community, meet with organic intellectuals, let them see the people in action, and let them get rid of their fear. I did a class several years back, and I was teaching sociology then, and they had to write three reaction papers, and one, one of them was in the community, and I would give them things that were happening. It was sociology, it wasn't the Chicano studies. And so one day they said, well, can you give us an idea? While an African brother called me and said, hey, we're having this African um, theater group uh, this particular night invite your students. So I invited the students and they had to write a reaction paper. In one paper, I'll never forget, because I met with her. She wrote about the fear she had of going to East Denver, five points, and having two black men at a, at a the light was ready, they were standing there, and her being afraid that they were going to break into her car. And she, it was a really good essay. And she really told me, that's what you told us to write what we feel. I said, good. What did you learn? She goes, God, what was, what was I thinking? I said, well, that's the fear you have about coming into contact with other groups. Take them out there. They'll, the, the nonprofit leaders will love it. And not only that, you can start a, a what do you call it? A, what do you do? Work, work while you study? Work study. Yeah. What do you do? Say? Oh, I thought you meant like internships. Internships. But work study. I studied, we did several internships with nonprofits, and we also have a leadership. We had a leadership program with the state legislature for 15 students would study the legislative process, and they actually were involved in the whole process. That's the kind of innovative work that gets people out there, gives them opportunities and learning experiences. La practica is being able to get the theory and say, does it work in there or not? And sometimes we and we talk about the papers and we say, well, you know, they, they bashed our Cinco de Mayo. You know, there was a time that they were having the fights and, and the cops came out one year with, what, they, 200 cops? And they arrested it. Now, they gave 800 tickets out? Well, they happened, that happened to be the one that they were at. They said, well, what's all that about? And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Why do you think they did that? Because you, you were pretty critical. I said, that's good. But let's take it deeper. Why did them kids do that? Why was, what do you think has been going on with them? I said, you haven't heard it here yet? They don't know their history and they're angry? And they want to take it out of somebody, something? They're in pain? They're being discriminated against? Those are the deeper issues. What you saw was a manifestation of people that carry the trauma with them onto the streets during a Cinco de Mayo, uh, what do you call it, the lowrider show. Car, what do you call it, uh, the lowriders. Yeah, I wrote a piece, my son said, hey dad, can you write, would you write a piece on the lowriders? The guys want to know where you stand on that issue. <laughs> I said, I love lowriders. Uh, I'll write but, along. <laughs> uh, but I, 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 <laughs> write those stories, no? I, I told him, you do not have the right to go piss in somebody's neighborhood and throw bottles in there and all of that. That I don't agree with. But you do have the right, well, we didn't invent the automobile, a guy named Henry Ford did, and, and the gas guzzlers are being mad because if you don't, you don't use gas when you go up and down, it's the system that doesn't like it because they're threatened. 
behave when you're out there. So what we did one year, we got a team of cameras. And every time the people had gotten beat up by the cops, somebody would stop, we'd go with the camera and turn them on. They changed their behavior. This is before all this stuff. So you know, they carried that and that was happening, right, George? Remember? Right. Then we took them, we got them on tape. They went to their commander in chief and he called us and said, What happened? He said, Well, we got your permission. He goes, I did give them permission to do that. Boy, they were angry. They were angry because we had now I remember when they were pulling up to a liquor store. And they bought liquor. So we went to the car. And I turned with that turned on the camera. And I didn't check that. He says, not my job. He didn't check the ID or nothing, but that kid was probably under 18. So, you know, nobody, uh, that he who has committed no sin cast the first stone. You know, we have to be honest with things that we need to work on in our community. The, the, the tough conversations. I mean, I worked in the field of mental health. I mean, worked with Vietnam veterans. That was tough work, but, but beautiful work, healing work. So that's why I come from this. Usually it's, I just got to heal. There were a bunch of wounded spirits in this room. I can feel it already. Next, or another, yes? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm a bilingual teacher with a master's in CLD, which is culturally and linguistically diverse. But um, I was wondering, with this new bill that, that just passed, will there be some type of um, spillover into the teacher program from the Chicano studies so that we do have more uh, culturally aware teachers so that when they're in the classroom, they could be more um, sympathetic or empathetic to our students. Well, we, we are, one of our collaborations has always been with the teacher ed department, particularly the ELL, English as a second, ESL and LLA and all the concepts they use. We've worked with them. When I walked in in 2006 through the University of Colorado in, in Boulder, the Bueno Center, they had gotten a big grant, and the grant consisted of 26 uh, students getting degrees in Chicano studies, minors in ESL, and a licensure. So, man, that, I mean, they thought I was a magical magician. Because we had never had that many at one time, you know, enrolled. And so we, they all grabbed 24 graduated. Very successful program was what you're talking about. And then what happened is the state legislature went back to the old form where before you got a, you got a degree in the discipline, history, Chicano studies, women's studies, da 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 da. And then you got your certificate, they turned it around and you had to get a licensure through that process and then pick up a specialty area, which then took away the, the major from us. Because we were gonna write it, and we had already started working on another grant. So we need to talk to the legislature and say to them, why don't you go back to them? Now that systemic racism and Black Lives Matters is here, you got this new bill, why don't you shift that over? So that we can train the teachers that need to know what they need to do in those classrooms. So I don't know that they're necessarily gonna get more involved than they already are, but at some given point, it would be nice to be creative in, in bringing in federal dollars to teach the, the kids that are. And it, my grandson, his girlfriend, my wife, taught bilingual ed for 26 years. They came over for dinner, and she got to talking to my to to Dorothy. And they left. Dorothy started crying. But what's wrong? She goes, Carolina is exactly what the system produced. She can't write, read or write English or Spanish. And her self-esteem is way low. So Dorothy's working with her. And why did that happen? She goes, because they didn't apply the right philosophy in bilingual education at the time I was in. That's what the big fight was about. How do you teach somebody a different language? And it still isn't resolved. And it, the major issue was that we didn't have the teachers that spoke good, good Spanish, and then they could teach it. And like Joe, Joe Navarro's poem writes, he writes a poem in perfect, good, intellectual English, and then intellectual Spanish. And then in the, the third stanza is broken, broken English, the fourth stanza is broken Spanish, 
In the fifth stanza, he goes, now I am functionally bi-illiterate. That's what happened to her. And it was sad. I go, so that's what you've been talking about? She goes, yeah, I've been telling you that forever. I saw it. And it was painful. And she's bright. So we're going to get her up to par. And that's what we need to do. We need to, to make sure that, that it's done correctly and that, it, that we, get the, we get teachers that know, know what they're doing. And I'm not saying perfect Spanish. No, I'm, I'm bien pocho. I'm, yeah, and, and so I know that. So but people that know the rules, how to teach it, and so forth, that's really important. But what happened during that time in history, back in the 60s, the law passed. There was nobody that could teach it. And then it got into a big fight. How do you teach it? Do you reverse them? Or what do you do? Those are initiatives that you can kind of blend in with the other departments, the Spanish department. Judy, correct me if I'm wrong, Judy Baca, but I think our teacher ed students have to take Chicano studies as one of their electives. Is that true? Good. Uh, or they have to take uh, it's called Voices of Protest. Voices of Protest. And uh, in social work, the students are required to take this introduction to Chicano studies because the concept is you better go out and work in our communities and work with our populations. You better know about the culture of and I'm trying to get Chicano studies required for every discipline, because I think it should be. But years ago, was when we set up the, remember the cultural component requirement? Mm -hmm. Well, the focus was, uh, hopefully it is gonna be, uh, you know, taking uh, more ethnic studies like Chicano studies. And what ended up happening is because culture is, can be anything. You know, there's a culture of using the toilet, or there's a culture of, so it, almost every course fit into the cultural component, and it's really watered down. I think we still have a taste of some in place. We do, and that's one of the, I'm, I serve on the Gen Ed board, and that's one of the things that we need to tackle is to do a better job of defining what that cultural, you know, uh, requirement, what it should mean, so I you know, would welcome input about that. About that. I want to interject something. I want to read something to you guys. This is, I, I spoke at the beginning of the day about our vision to be the People's University of the Southwest. This is our value statement, okay? It's on our website. CSU Pueblo is dedicated to interdisciplinary learning and entrepreneurship that elevates our people and our community, creates educational opportunities, fosters unique collaborations and supports inclusion, access and affordability as a gateway to the world. Sounds to me like they're talking about Chicano studies. Sounds to me like, you know, the, the uh, administration ought to be very interested in the concepts that we're talking about today and that the, the foundation is there and we can help to build out that reality. I, I think they, Oh, let's hear from John. Um, this is where I think my three questions to you is that I, I, you know what, I can't hardly understand you this half. You know what? I think this is where my three question to you would fit in very well about um, you know, the administration sort of having some sympathy to the idea of Chicago studies, but it keeps going further and further down their list of priorities. And you say to someone with authority, um, this is a Hispanic serving institution. Um, therefore, there should be a strong Chicano Studies Department. Don't you agree? And they'll say something like, "Yes, I agree." But then, you know, it just gets very frustrating, right? Because they'll agree, and then they'll go on to five other of their priorities before they come to something like this. Um, and my, my question to you was, other than just simply yelling at them, it's like, can't you see the connection? How would you improve? the quality of the argument 
to get them to see that connection so that it would move further up the list of priorities. Do you see what I'm saying? You know, when I went got to Metro, they had just decided to become an HSI. And so I was asked to be uh, one of the one of the, the persons that was involved. So we used that as motivation. I said you can't. Chicano Studies is a recruiting tool. I taught concurrent enrollment classes at South, West, East, North, Escuela, and Montbello. And many of the students came in and I told the dean, you know, it's really a recruiting tool for Metro, even though she let me teach it under UCD, because I had been teaching with it for a long time. And but students were coming in, so um, it's kind of like one time I did diversity training at a bank. And the guy said, man, this is a waste of money, Ramon. This is a waste of money. And I said, you know, because I'm a trainer, I had asked to some of the complaints that have been filed. So, sir, you either pay now or you pay later. He goes, I like that, Ramon. I like that. Let's continue the training. <laughs> Talk to them in economic terms and enrollment terms because that's how they listen. But the other piece is we were working with all of the major groups, activist groups in Denver to get the HSI. And some of that whole fear went away and they realized that people were working on behalf. And then thirdly, we had board members. So I'm talking higher level, above the, the administrators, the board of trustees. We had two attorneys that were just dead set on doing some, some really good creative change, policy change at Metropolitan State University, even to the point that, well, what happened is they wanted to find tuition rates between out-of-state and in-state for undocumented workers and an attorney showed them how to do it. When they did it, all hell broke loose at the state legislature. And then guess what happened? They came back and said, my goodness, that was good. And then they passed the asset bill. And they even came further and said, how did you do this? And they sent Dr. Jordan to Washington. So sometimes you have to take a risk. And it's, you know, you know, some people, yeah, they don't like that, but you take a risk and you, you stay together and say, we know what we're doing. You have to trust what we're doing. But I worked with them for, it took 10 years to get the HSI. We went from 12.5% to 25. And that's, the, we have 24,000 students at Metro. So we had to do a lot of work. And then when we finally got the collaboration we needed, it became an HSI. And then other things kind of fell in place, including some parts of Chicano Studies, not all of it. I'm putting my provost hat on for a moment, even though I'm not, so this is a not an argument I endorse, but um, what you would hear from the upper administration here is, well, if this is so important, then why don't we have the students in those classes already? The fact that you don't have the students in those classes already must be evidence that it's not important. Okay. Therefore, I'm going to go on to these other priorities. Well, that's the whole policy issue. If you have policies that students have to take in order to graduate classes that have value that added to their knowledge that allowed them to participate in the workforce afterwards they'll buy the argument because they're going to, we're going to have to train students at that level so we have to change the policies that's what we've been arguing we change the policies and then things will, will fall in place i'm going to um, give this uh, microphone over to um, maria here maria vega and then I saw another hand over here. Uh, but John, let me respond to what you just said. If it's so important, why aren't the students in the classroom? They're, that's systemic racism right there. And that's privilege because they're blaming the students. It's not, it's not us. And those words that they, it, that those words that were written in about three or four years ago, and what's happened since. So people know how to use the right words. What, what, how we solve that, John, is what we're doing in here now. We're doing it ourselves. Just when he held up those books, we have to write the books. We have to do the collaboration. We are the ones that have to be activists. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, Maria. <laughs> uh, Ramon, uh, you're talking about the uh, when the, the insult for the how we put down indios or indígenas, you know, in, in different cultures. Um, I know that when my experience in, in studying in Jalapa, Veracruz, is they would always say, 
no seas blanco, no seas blanco. And I was like, what is that? So then I asked, I asked questions, and he was saying, don't, don't be a totonaco. Don't act like a totonaco. Don't think like that. So they were putting down the totonaco. So I'm wondering, have you put like much thought as to a way that we could uh, like work on that and, and, and put that out there so that we could uh, validate, give, uh, give strength and all that to, to the, the indio and, and, and give more uh, voice and all that. So that, that's where we could turn that around and people quit, you know, yeah, stereotypes and all that. You know, when you look at the history of Mexico, Mexico was racially stratified. You had the Cachupin, the Criollo, the Mestizo, the Dos de Abajo, the, all of the subgroups underneath that. It, that. That was part, they got that from the Spaniards. The Spaniards set up a racial stratification system in their structure that we inherited since the 15th century. So they always felt, even Porfirio Diaz, the Scientificos, what was his about? His was feeling inferior. Octavio Paz says the Mexican is not inferior, they feel inferior. And they feel inferior because of what they've gone through throughout history. So when you start teaching the correct history, giving it more positive interpretations with facts and so forth, things can change at that level. But call it to it, call it on the carpet. Because we you look at our community. When I grew up, and I'll use myself as an example, I remember the concept. And Huero was the light complected Chicano. El Moreno was the cafe brown one, and El Prieto was the dark color. And that's how we did. We, we inherited that caste system. And, and in, in our family, I remember those words being thrown around. It's, it's bien Prieto. Like that was bad. And that was what we had learned. I mean, that's how, how deep it's ingrained. And so we have to work on that as well. Because, you know, the five branches in our family, that the head us are very, very dark. And the Maseas, blonde hair and blue eyes in our family, the five women that had kids. And so we, I remember hearing those stories. And so uh, that's internalized. That's the internalized oppression that Paulo Freire writes about, I think. And I wanted to mention real quick before I forget, here uh, we started the thing called El Alma de la Casa, which was an alternative curriculum. We made 87 units Imagine 83 more pounds like that. And they bought a million dollars worth of books, everything that accompanied them. LAC, the, the external group, worked with them in the 1990s. Luis Torres was the architect of, of developing this. And I don't show this because of my poetry's in here, but it's because Lisa Sims, uh, Charlene's daughter, wrote this. This is an awesome piece of work for some, I mean, for, for a teacher. Oh man, this is awesome. Here's one on Curanderismo. So start looking at developing a curriculum that you can sell. We, they used the Alma de la Raza more out of Denver than in Denver, because Denver got really threatened. In Denver, DPS, and I would say I would say to the new superintendent, this was sabotaged. It was sabotaged by the system, by people feeling, why are we teaching this kind of stuff here? Why, because of the white paradigm. The, the master narrative was operative at that point. And when you confront the master narrative, you have to deal with the flack. There's going to be, in, in the dialectical process, there's going to be that pull and tug. And you have to be ready for that. It's not, it's not easy work. It's good work. And that's why I say keep yourself spiritually healthy and, because sometimes it gets to you and it's like, man, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired, I'm burnt out. But, but we're, we're reviving this. We've already talked to him and this is going to, we're going to put life back into this 87 unit things instead of reinventing the wheel. These be like, we're going to go over through the whole thing and change the stand, up, update the standards. But uh, if you invite Luis for the 50th, I mean, we can talk about about the work that was done with that. It was it was really powerful work, and then they decided they didn't want it, and so they just abandoned it. They did it institutionally, bits and pieces here. They would we'll do it here, and then before you know it. It's all torn apart. And people were no longer interested in what it was meant to be. But that came from teachers. That this came from teachers. Lisa Sims is a teacher when she did this. My wife worked on one. She was a teacher. A bunch of people worked on it. And then, second, one thing I do want to show you, and I know you're going to know why, so I'm an evil maniac. Well, this one here, that's in Kansas. Wow, that's beautiful. 
So what that is is the mills. We grew up the packing houses and the mills in, in, in north in the north north end barrio. And they sent me that picture. That that, that mill is, I mean, that, that's a big old building. And they, they now have that there and they're, they're doing some of the archival work that you're doing. I told Luis that I was a pack rat. And he goes, Ramon, you're not a pack rat, you're an archivist. <laughs> <laughs> I said, go tell my wife that. <laughs> but anyway, and then I wanted to show this one because Ah, that is done by Lucha, Lucha's uh, father, Emmanuel Martinez. When I saw that, as I, for my therapy, I shoot pool. And I saw that, but I couldn't afford it again. And he goes, I'll give you a payment plan. I said, you got it, brother. So I paid him by a month. I got that, in, that's just by him. I mean, he's, he's a famous artist. So I got that in my, in my, in my house. And all the work that I showed here, most of it was is parts of the things that I bought. So art reminds you and sit down and think about it as you're reading and learning, look at the art, and then you begin to interpret the art differently through the archival work that you do and the reading. But I wanted to show that because I, I like that piece that he did. It's out of care. I mean, it's not whatever Chicano art is, but he did that piece of that. So the minute I walked into his, his studio, I said, is that for sale? He goes, it is. I go, how much? I go, oh, no way, man, I can't. He goes, I'll give you a good deal. Give you a, give you credit and payment plan, so. Any other questions? I just wanted to thank you for bringing art and literature into your presentation today. Thank you very much. And we, we have uh, literature, music, and art professors here today as part of the group. And um, yeah, I just, I, I'm interested in how you all think about those kinds of disciplines together with this and you know Fran I know you're going to have art and science come together in your project so do you have any sort of advice about integrating the humanities with the with the social sciences and sciences absolutely I think I mean there, we have a Arnold Spresquist teaches art, art, Mexican art, although he, he's, a, he's a famous Chicano artist as well. I would say again, collaborate and not be afraid to say, well, we, we can't, there's no way we can do it. Yeah, you can. If you sit down and think it through how you could establish working together and creating something, you know, maybe a, a certificate in, in art and poetry or art in the humanities, you could do that. You could sit down and somebody could walk out with an additional certificate, give you some students, get them students, give them more knowledge and information, make them more diverse, more interdisciplinary. Just sit back and think it through. When we did the, uh, the one with the mental health and then we, we did the, the one at CU and, oh, uh, this year, two, several years ago, Lorenzo Trujillo, famous lawyer, helped, heard some big cases also a PhD, he's a musicologist, and he's a mariachi. We set up a program. Now, I didn't like it at first, why? Because I, I run a department with music. So they now have a mariachi program, but it's in music, because I couldn't afford a bunch of instruments. And he said, well, we'll, we'll take care of everything, you just work with us, so Lorenzo is now teaching mariachis, and oh God, they, the, the musicians that, that, that he's developing, that's part of the culture. That was a combination of our, of uh, music and kids from Mexico that already began playing the, the violin or the guitar or the, the, the trumpet and et cetera, et cetera, are now doing performances and they cost. We hired him, I said, you charge what? He said, well, you know, we gotta make some money. I said, all right, we'll pay you that, but there's creativity. Think it through and you can, you can do it, poetry, we have poetry recitals, coalesce with the English department, put together, invite some of the poets from the English department, the Chicano poets. We used to have, get 100 kids, get them in there, listen to poetry. What you're really doing is, you're uh, teaching them, but then you're also doing recruiting and catching their interest about different kinds of poetry other than just what's taught in American literature classes. So that, that we did that. And, any creative kinds of things in collaborating on campus, we would do, yes. 
I, I'm only going to jump in because you're in my discipline. Uh, um, you, you really have me thinking here today. Obviously, I'm not from this region. This is not my history. Um, but I'm even thinking, I teach a very esoteric music theory class of the Western canon and the compositional styles of the Renaissance, the Baroque and classical period coming up this fall. Um, and even not being from this region, I know enough to know that there is real examples of, um, from Latin American of, of Renaissance style, Baroque style, classical style music written. Um, I need to do my research because I want to be able to integrate some of that music. Um, this is not Mariachi, but it's a way and a course that is that may be seemingly far removed from Chicano studies to actually find a connection. But I'm also sitting here recognizing that I need some training. I need um, some, some pedagogical direction and make sure that my best intentions don't fall into traps and don't accomplish everything that they should and could. And so I think of this past year where we have spent an enormous amount of time as faculty and pedagogical training around how to use technology, how to be effective in remote teaching because of what COVID had forced us to learn, and suddenly thinking maybe there are opportunities, maybe through the center, maybe through this very room, that we could continue that pedagogical exploration now. We've got our technology down, I think. We, we got that done in a year. But maybe in the year ahead, we could start as an institution thinking about how do we get um, to, to, to this content, even in something as esoteric as Renaissance compositional style. Um, you know, what you might want to think about is getting to know people yeah, in the exactly. Chicago studies. Yeah, I'm saying, about to reach out okay, to this person you know, right now. Like, say to them, what do you think about, you know, you, like you say, you do your homework and that, that style you talked about, learning about that and say, can I offer this in your class? Can I do a lecture and get their interest? And then he, she goes, yeah, if I can get a mariachi to come and play for you. Yeah. You, you trade it off and people learn more. I mean, and then before you know it, you're catching the interest of about something that people didn't know. I didn't know about what you just shared. I think that's beautiful and that, that ought to be explored and do a lecture for the, the prof. And before you know it, you catch interest and people will start realizing that there's connections that can be made from something that you never thought about. So that's a good idea. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, thank you for this today. It's been, it's been really eye-opening. I appreciate it. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you She just taught a class called uh, Musical Tapestries of the Southwest. And uh, we were, Rhonda and I were talking about um, cross collaborations between CC and MCSU Pueblo. So I'm sure she would love to do a class, you know, even if it's one session, um, a guest. I did a, a collaboration with her last year, and I was teaching a class called um, Art, Power, and Resistance alongside her Musical Tapestries class. And we invited uh, Greg Deal. Uh, indigenous artist, but he had a, he has a musical piece that really worked well for both of our classes. So that's another option, right? Where it's like you don't have to be the expert right, on yeah. Chicago studies, but you're working with somebody, right, who has the training or who's designed a course around that, where you can bring that into your classroom. So keep keep that in mind too. Like I said, we're always willing to partner, and I can put you in touch with Liliana because she I'm sure she would be willing to. Excellent, excellent. You know another piece is that um, you don't have to. Very far. Bernadette Garcia did a presentation to graduates of our music program. She's a very fine uh, musician and also a great researcher. She did a presentation for the community on, um, uh, I think, Spanish composers, Spanish performers. Um, one of them was Martinez, and I believe she was a Baroque yeah. composer. There, there were some fine composers mm -hmm. all through. Already packed schedule. Yeah. So 
joining us here at the roundup. Um, we're not all knowledgeable about it, but um, it's here for the taking. I just uh, did a lesson plan called Chicano Studies for Librarians and Staff because it's really needed here. We don't have a large Hispanic um, staff. And, but, but I used uh, Carlos Jimenez's book, The Mexican American Heritage, and it covers all humanities. And it's really an easy read. It's not really hard. I don't know if anybody's you know, heard about Carlos Jimenez's The Mexican American Heritage. It's just really a neat one. But what I wanted to share was um, the interdisciplinary um, thing that I did. With the work, four war students I had in Chicano Studies, I taught it for six years, and I want to talk about the four war students I had, and it was a group of, um, um, for lack of better, Anglo-American students from Aurora. And for two weeks, they were my war students. They slumped, they yawned, they did the worst things that students can do. And so I pulled them in and I assigned them because I always had a, a short report from everybody. I assigned them to do reports on low riders. And they were part of the, what is that called? The automotive management? Right. Automotive management, all four of them were part of the automotive management uh, class. So I told them to do, I, I told them, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get together, figure out what you're gonna do. You're gonna go history, culture, engineering. Because to, to do, but, men do with low riders is really hard. The hydraulics, everything. Uh, so it took math. And then how do you sell this? Business, marketing, science. Do you know how, how much a paint job costs per low rider? $15,000. So I gave them the assignment and they came up with some wonderful reports. And I don't know what happened to them, but they developed a respect for Chicanos and, and for low riders. And this is what I told uh, the professor here about um, for technical writing, do something on low riders. You know, it takes a lot to get a car to be a low rider. Science, math, engineering, the whole bit. So they ended up to be not my favorite students, but my most memorable. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> I have a comment. Um, I just want to remind everybody that this year is marks like the 50th year of Chicago Studies in Pueblo, which includes the high schools, and at that time it was Southern Colorado State College. Okay? Uh, but I want to respect that because it was the state college that implemented the Chicago Studies here on campus. Uh, and we're hoping that that is also going to ignite uh, further interest and expand, you know, the offerings that we can have on this campus. I've run into a couple of issues. Part of them is enrollment. If a class does not receive a certain amount of students, then that class is jeopardized to being canceled. And I often said, you know what, if you're so in love with us and want us to be part of this Hispanic serving institution, you should not look at the enrollment. The fact that that course is offered, if we have seven students, it should go. Uh, however, I haven't been able to sell that. Uh, so that in economics is part of it. The other issue that I found is that student schedules Many classes are sucking up all the electives, you know, so that students many times go into a major and after they do all their, you know, all their general eds, they're, they, they can't really deviate and take other courses. And even my, the social work department is guilty of that, you know. We, we require the students to take so many classes that there's no room for other extra things. Uh, I'm, uh, the other thing is uh, part of the 50th is having panel discussions like in the area of arts. 
and humanities and literature and social work and psychology and business and I am I'm willing to sit down with anyone that is interested in, in implementing content. At one time we used to have Chicanos and psychology. Uh, a couple of times there's been independent studies on Chicanos and the law. Uh, so, you know, we've had those courses uh, in, in the past. So I'm hoping to throw out the 50th. There's gonna be a series of events, speaker series, and I'll be getting a hold of you, Ramon, and wanting to get a hold of Dr. Uh, Torres uh, regarding setting something up for you to come down again, but and to meet with a larger audience. This institute, I'm hoping that we're gonna have it again next year, because part of it is being able to look at the possibilities and how to implement Chicanos and Chicano Studies content in, in the programming. But there is some systemic problems that we're, we run into, and that is, like right now, I have a couple of students that need to graduate. I'm setting up independent study because I can't get the capstone course, because the capstone will only have my four students in it. So I, I'm setting up independent studies to be able to meet that elective requirement, I mean, that required funds. So, you know, so we run into the economic issue. The other thing I'm worried about is, again, the racial, uh, the, 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 all the things that critical race theories and uh, right before the pandemic, we were seeing ethnic studies being wiped out. We were seeing books being banned in that were part of the Chicago studies in certain schools, you know? So, you know, I think we're still gonna have to deal with that issue. And my, my concept is we live in a community that is symbolic of over half of the people that represent a, a certain uh, population, which is Chicano. There might, yeah, there is a small percentage of uh, Puerto Rican, Cubano, and stuff in Pueblo, but majority of them um, uh, reflect Mexican American, Chicano, and Chicano uh, folks. So, you know, we, we have that, that background. But uh, I, I just wish that, you know, if, if we're important and valuable, sometimes we need to take the risk and spend the extra money. And because one of the things I'm also dealing with is, I don't really wanna declare a minor because I've heard that some of the courses will be canceled. So that's another thing I'm running into. Yeah, I, my comment is that I think we're losing college students at the high school level here in Pueblo, Colorado. I spent 14 years as a Chicago Studies teacher, two hours a day at a high school here in Pueblo. And, and, and I know, I, I, I may not be able to prove it to you, but I know that kids that were in my class graduated and may not have, probably would not have, had they not had Chicago Studies. You see a fire light up in those kids. You see them lean forward and want it, that they want more. And you know what? Those kids, I, I, when I first went into that classroom, I really felt it was a dumping ground. They were sending kids there that the other teachers didn't want in their classroom. And little by little, in those 14 years, I just saw so much progress. And I, I gotta tell you, the kids that left my classroom came here. This, my classroom was a pipeline to this university. And we've gotta put some energy here and some money and some emphasis into that end of the pipeline because we're losing them before you guys ever get a chance to beat them. And, and that's the answer to the economic question because Universities run on enrollment. And if we don't get them here, if we don't 
if we can't get them through high school, they're not going to come here. Or if they do, it's going to be way after the fact, after they get a GED or, or something else. But I've I got to tell you, when this city had four high schools with good Chicano Studies programs, I, I'll bet you they had a higher uh, graduation rate, particularly of the kids that were in danger of not finishing. And, you know, I, I, I think I have kids that all had it, I mean, not all of them, of course, but uh, six or seven ankle bracelets in my classroom. I mean, they're already in trouble with the law. And, and you know, they just need so much help to get to this level to where they can catch fire and really get some enthusiasm for their futures, for their lives, for their pride. You know what? Chicago Studies did for me, and, and I saw it in my students, is that it developed pride. And when you have pride, you will not allow yourself to fail. It's the pride knowing that, that you can do it that makes you do it. But some of these kids have such a bad impression of themselves uh, or opinion of themselves that they don't have good reason to have pride. And if, if that's all we do in Chicago Studies is give them pride. You know, the other teachers used to say, what do you teach? I said, I teach them the secret handshake. You know? <laughs> and I don't care, because sometimes it's that secret handshake that pulls them in. So. That's my God. <laughs> oh, okay, and speaking of finishing, yes. Uh, and yeah, yes, but um, let me um, just make a, a an announcement. Yes, uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> it's three o'clock, and we're uh, had planned to go till um, you know four with more. Uh, uh, dialogue. However, let's use the rest of the time to network if you want. Now's the time to talk to someone that you want to connect with, get their information, etc. Take your time. Um, I do know that Karen Ryball has to travel this evening, so she, you know, she's going to have to leave a little earlier than intended. Um, and uh, I, I just want to. Uh, uh, also uh, wrap up a little bit by saying thank you to Joelle Quigley, who you can see it, she worked very hard today. And um, Julie Stevens, uh, who's in at her desk right now. Um, these two women pull, helped us pull this together in short order. And uh, thank you uh, very much, Ramon and, and Karen. Um, for your responsiveness. We, we called um, and asked a very big question. And here they came across, look how beautifully um, they added to our experience here today and with such knowledge and, and uh, you know, uh, sensitivity, <laughs> kindness. Thank you for your time. Okay. Um, and to our faculty that joined us today. Thank you, because we can't do it without you. We need you. And you came today and you listened and, you, and we appreciate that so much. Don't worry so much about offending and I, let us apologize if we offend you. What we appreciate is sincerity, and, and uh, there's nothing like work uh, to get the work done. So um, help us, because we will have to speak to the administration pretty soon, hopefully soon, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, to carry this idea uh, forward of um, <clears throat> more research and in interdisciplinary classes, and making, we're the people who can make this a Southwestern University. It, we are the people of the university, okay? And so, um, and what, what I said earlier is that sometimes people know how to use the right words, and they may mean it, but they don't know how to, to implement that. So here we are, we want to help, we're here to help. So thank you so much. 
Um, any other words, Rhonda? I did, uh, my microphone, they were down in the studio. I just wanted to uh, also say just an acknowledgement, Dr. Derek Lopez. Um, Many of you know Dr. Derek Lopez couldn't be here today, but he did, through one of his Title V grants, provide the funding for today's event. So I wanted to acknowledge Derek and his support. Hopefully you'll see us on the video later. Um, and also let you know that Dr. Mote uh, specifically asked us to tape uh, this so that he could watch it later, and he is very interested in it as well. And um, Deborah, thank you very much for your time and effort in organizing and bringing it together. Um, I think I would just like to send us forward too with a couple of how can I, what can I do next? Um, as was mentioned, this is the 50th anniversary of Chicano Studies on our campus and Judy and Victoria Obregón are planning an entire year of activities. So keep your eye open for lectures and um, other presentations and George Otterby wanted me to mention that uh, Federico Peño will be on our campus uh, September 13th. We'll be talking more about a lot of these issues there. So there'll be lots of opportunity for dialogue and we will, there is a evaluation form on your table too. So before you leave, if you could give us an anonymous feedback on this. We want this to be the first annual institute and we'd like to know how we could make it more effective or more helpful next time. Yes, thank you. Uh, I also want to uh, rec recognize the community people that, that joined us today. Uh, thank you as well. They're, they're busy writing, so we'll let them finish. <laughs> but anyone from the community if you want to know more about the Aslan Center, if you want to help us um, in our mission, please talk to me. Uh, I'll be happy to answer all your questions. Well, how about one last round of applause for our two speakers, and thank you both for your time tonight. I think there are cookies left.